and welcome to the latest edition of the Health and Safety Matters podcast. I'm Mark Sennett. I'm a CEO of Western Business Media, the publishers of Health and Safety Matters. Delighted this podcast is once again sponsored by the Health and Safety event. And as you might have seen, the event has now moved until the 27th, 28th and 29th of April 2021. This will still take place at the NEC in Birmingham and it will be co-located with the fire safety event, the facilities event, the security event and now also the emergency services show and main tech. For more information and to register for your free pass to those events, all you have to do is go to www.healthandsafetyevent.com. And in fact, later in this edition of the podcast, we'll be joined by event director David Bishop. If you want all the latest news in the health and safety sector, please do go to the Health and Safety Matters website, which is www.hsmsearch.com. We've got a number of CPD accredited webinars that you can watch for free, all the latest health and safety news and products. And you can sign up for free also to receive our twice a week e-newsletter or to receive a free copy of our magazine, Health and Safety Matters, six times a year. So as always, we start off with the news and there's quite a bit to cover this week. So the first story I want to talk about is a little bit different than what we normally talk about. I've, I've covered prosecutions before, but this is a particularly sad, sad prosecution. There's a pretty rare kind of incident for us to cover, so that was worth sharing. So Wirral Borough Council has been fined after a branch from a tree fell and struck the vehicle of a pregnant mother while she was driving her two children to school. Elizabeth Steer suffered injuries and later the sad loss of her prematurely born baby. So this case was heard in Liverpool Magistrates Court just last week. And the court heard that Elizabeth had been performing a daily school run with her children when she was driving on the A551 Arrow Park Road with her 13-year-old daughter and 6-year-old son. While moving, her vehicle was struck by a large branch falling from a mature horse chestnut tree. The branch broke through the windscreen of the front driver window and struck the right side of Elizabeth's stomach. She was taken to hospital with a suspected major trauma and her baby girl, Lucia Jane Steer, was delivered by emergency caesarean, but unfortunately only lived for 13 hours before sadly passing away. The HSC investigated this incident and it found that the large branch which had had a crack on the upper edge where it joined the main trunk, had progressively got worse and it began to separate from the main trunk for at least one growing season before this branch fell. The tree, which was located within the boundary of Arrow Park, which is adjacent to the road, had not been inspected for at least 13 years. Wirral Borough Council, according to the HSC, failed to identify and manage the risks from falling trees and branches and failed to implement a robust system of inspections of trees in its remit, despite a similar incident occurring in Arrow Park Road in January 2015. Wirral Borough Council pled guilty to breaching Section 3.1 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, and the authority was fined £100,000 and ordered to pay costs of £49,363. After the hearing, HSE Inspector Rowan Lai said, There are no winners in this sad case. Councils have a duty to proactively assess and control the risk to members of the public. This tragedy could so easily have been avoided if the risk has been identified. Warnings had been heeded and an adequate tree management system had been implemented. Tragically, due to these systemic failures, Elizabeth, Alex and together with their two children have been left without Lucia and have had to restructure their lives for the devastating impact they've individually experienced. Now, I wanted to share this with you because, yes, of course, we cover HSE prosecutions all the time. This is a, you know, a really sad case, but a number of you work for local authorities. A number of you work for local councils. And this is worth just covering exactly what the responsibilities are. And it's a, it's a real reminder, as I said, of a topic we don't talk about. The fact that you do need to identify and manage the risks of falling trees to protect members of the public. Uh, of course, your own staff are there. But here, you know, the real the real tragedy here is 13 years without being an inspection has led to the death of you know, a prematurely born baby. A terrible story, a huge fine there, £100,000, you know, effectively £150,000 total enforcement. And it just shows you that Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act is enforceable if members of the public are put at risk from not a proper method of work from managing trees. So it's not often we get to talk about this, and thank heavens it's not a situation like this doesn't happen very often. But I think the real aggravating factor here is there was a similar incident in January 2015. So I thought that was worth sharing. And it leads on naturally to our next news story I want to cover, and that is that agriculture has the worst worker fatality figures. The Health and Safety Executive has published a report that reveals agriculture has the worst rate of worker fatality injuries in Great Britain. 
Last year, 21 people were killed in agriculture and one was a child. The report, which is titled Fatal Injuries in Agriculture, Forestry and Fishing in Great Britain 2019-2020, has been published to coincide with the start of Farm Safety Week. And yes, this happens every year between the 20th to 24th of July. Led by the Farm Safety Foundation charity, the week shines a light on fire safety and well-being in the sector. The HSE statistics just highlight that agriculture continues to have a worse rate of fatal injuries than anybody else. In fact, it's 18 times higher than the average rate for all industries. You know, this news follows on from the last podcast where we talked about the number of workplace fatalities actually dropping once again year on year. As I said then, yeah, they're relatively static uh, over the years, but this, when you drill down into the detail, this is the not good aspect of it. Of course, no fatalities are acceptable and everyone has a right to come work from home safe. But I remember very much a campaign that's been done before. I think it was by the HSC, which talks about the right to come home safe in the agricultural sector. And once again, when you look at this, 21 people lost their lives this year working in the agricultural sector, 18 times higher than the average rate. That, that's a staggering percentage increase. Transport-related incidents, by the way, such as overturning vehicles or vehicles being stuck with moving you, was responsible for more deaths than any other cause this year in the agriculture sector. Around half of the workers here were 55 years or older that sadly passed away, with older workers being disproportionately the most at risk of fatal injuries on farms. The youngest person killed last year was a four-year-old child. So what that shows us is, once again, the single biggest killer in agriculture industries is farm machinery, farm transport machinery, I should say, such as tractors, etc. The HSC is urging all farmers to keep children safe, while they stay at home during COVID-19, take particular attention to that. Children must not be allowed in the farm workplaces unless they are very carefully supervised. It's illegal to carry children under 13 in the cab of an agricultural vehicle, and it's unsafe. And they're urging everyone to go to the HSE website for more information on this. It's, it's interesting, my, my grandfather worked on a farm, and I can tell you that I did sit in the cab of uh, tractors, when I was a kid. So, you know, first-hand experience, I remember being three, four, five, sat on my grandfather's knee going around the farm while he drove a tractor. So it's a fond memory for me, but it's not legal now. So we need to make sure that if you're working in the agricultural sector, keep yourself safe, keep children safe. No one under the 13 years of age should be allowed in an agricultural vehicle. But as I said right at the start of this, staggering statistics percentage-wise, 21 people may not be a huge amount of people to have died in the grand scheme of things, but it's still 21 people too many. And it is a sector that when you look at the total amount of workplace fatalities in the UK, that's a big, big percentage of it. So again, two stories to do with fatal incidents, unfortunately, both relating to children, you know, those statistics from agriculture and of course the the council prosecution. So what I want to do now is move on to more positive things and we'll be back with the news in a minute. I sat down here this week with Ian McKinnon and Ian is the managing director of CHAS, which is the Contractors Health and Safety Assessment Scheme, which is the UK's leading provider of risk prevention, compliance and supply and chain management services for clients and contractors. It's great sitting down with Ian and here's what he had to say. <music> Afternoon, Ian. How are you? Very good, thank you, Mark. Very good. Well, thanks for joining us. So I want to talk about CHAS today. What's been the biggest challenges for CHAS contractors and clients in terms of working safely during the coronavirus pandemic? Well, I actually think the industry as a whole has done a great job in providing guidance for working safely. And uh, we've, we've helped pass on that guidance. We've been providing information to our contractors. I think one, obviously one of the challenges has been is as more information is known, that guidance has continued to evolve. But I think most of the organizations we're working with are making sure that their operations and how they communicate with their workforce has been done really well. I think one of the challenge for clients is making sure that they know how their supply chain is performing and making sure that their supply chain is following the right guidance and that contractors are able to demonstrate that they are. I think obviously we've been working and, and making sure we um, share information on the Construction Leadership Council's advice. And also we have a lot of conversations with trade associations, trade bodies who provide specific information about how their members and how contractors in those industries 
should perform and should uh, make sure they're working safely. So I think everyone's been adapting very well, but obviously practically on the ground, you know, putting it into practice is often a challenge. So what's Chaz doing to help? Well, apart from, or sorry, not apart from, in addition to, um, you know, giving that advice to contractors, what we've done um, at the request of many of our contractors and clients is allowed contracts to, contractors to evidence the actions they're taking. So the first thing is, is we've asked contractors to just confirm that they are working to those industry best practices. And then in addition to that, we're um, asking to see evidence of the risk assessments that they've undertaken to make sure that they are following the best practice as advised by the HSE. So we're looking to see evidence of the signage and of the training, et cetera, et cetera that they are giving to their workforce. And that's actually gone really well. And, uh, you know, the majority of our contractors have actually already responded to that and are very keen to demonstrate that, they're, that they are adhering and, you know, practicing in a safe, safe way. So for those not familiar with Chaz, could you tell us a bit more about what the organization is and does? Absolutely. So Chaz has been going for over 20 years now and was set up in the late 90s to address um, health and safety, accidents and fatalities, etc. across the construction industry. And over the last 20 years, we must have assessed probably 120, 130,000 different contractors. And we look at their safety practices, their safety training, the risk assessments they undertake, and making sure that they operate in a safe way. Currently, with all the contractors on our, you know, that, that we assess, there's probably over a million employees that we ensure, you know, go to work and go home safely every day. Over the last few years, we've extended that capability beyond just health and safety. Uh, We're now one of the principal providers of the common assessment standard across the construction industry. Um, And we provide additional services as well. So really, we've used the basis of what Chaz has been well known for, which is providing health and safety assessments to organizations to actually expand that into a broader set of risk management services. So in your opinion, what lessons has the industry learned from the coronavirus crisis so far? I think the the industry has learned a number of lessons. Firstly, I think it has accelerated digital transformation. The need for information on suppliers, information on risk to be made visible and shared in a digital way to try and allow people to work as quickly and as safely as they can on sites. I think the other area of learning is I think the, the crisis over the last few months isn't just about working practices. Obviously, it's also going to be around the financial sustainability, the financial strength of organizations. And I think, therefore, one of the things is is that risk management of the supply chain has obviously, therefore, you know, gained even more emphasis than it did before. People are very keen and, uh, you know, the, the importance of using their suppliers and contractors to fulfill projects is, is, is obviously, you know, important, but they're keen to know and manage the risks right throughout their supply chain, both of the businesses and the employees within those businesses. Is the construction industry prepared for a second wave of this pandemic, do you think? I think that's a great question. And I think, you know, it's a broader question. Are we all prepared for the second wave? But I think it's a great question. I think we, we are being asked all the time to, to make sure that we're working with our contractors to make sure they are prepared and have learned lessons uh, around the, uh, you know, the current crisis and make sure they're ready for a second wave. I think people have now got good working practices. So it shouldn't all, you know, at the beginning of the first wave, if you like, there was very much everything came to a standstill. I think people know what they're doing and are able to adapt and move quickly as it relates to a second wave. So I think that's very good. And people have put in additional practices. Uh, Chaz, for example, have enabled contractors uh, and individual employees to carry what we would call a Chaz Health Wallet, which allows them to demonstrate their current health, demonstrate whether they are, um, you know, their, their health from on a week to week basis, and that they can prove to the clients on whose sites they're working that they're fit to come on site. And that's part of a broader approach the whole industry's taken. People are taking temperature checks as people come on site. They're asking for declarations. And I think that there's just constant, constant reinforcement around hygiene messages. So I think the 
the industry is better prepared for the second wave. Obviously, going into winter, that's going to be somewhat harder. Um, but I think all the practices have been learned. And certainly amongst um, our members, we're just seeing really good, proactive measures being taken to make sure that they can fulfill the requirements of their clients. So outside of COVID-19, what else is going on with Chaz? Chaz is going through a real transformation at the moment. We've built on, you know, a whole set of years of success now and and our clients are asking us to do more. And I'd say, therefore, the, the key changes at the moment are around continuing to build the skills of the team. Um, I was delighted to announce that we've brought on board two new non-executive directors uh, this month, Elaine Bailey, who was previously the uh, chief executive of Hyde Housing um, and who currently sits on uh, Dame Judith Hackett's uh, review of, you know, post-Grenfell of uh, safety behavior and practices in the construction industry. Uh, She's come on board and joined us. And uh, Peter Hepworth, ex-Capita, a really successful business leader, um, understands risk management as well. So he's joined us along with Elaine as non-exec directors. And we have additional people coming in from the construction industry on uh, safety, on sustainability and environmental matters. So a lot of key appointments we're bringing on board. A lot of good collaborations. Our approach during the last two or three months is to say, let's make sure all of our members and all the uh, contractors in the construction industry come out of this crisis in the best possible shape to win business. So we've been doing a lot of work with the National Federation of Builders, um, with different other trade associations. On our smaller members, we've signed a recent deal with Checker Trade to give people an opportunity in the domestic market and also integrated our services into a number of the procurement and supplier management platforms, such as Causeway and uh, coins, etc. So some really good stuff going on to make sure our contractors have the best opportunities and that our individuals and our strategic thinking in terms of how Chaz can respond to the market and help the market by some really key appointments. And for those who want to find out more about Chaz, how can they get in touch with you and find out more? Well, our website is, is as it's always been, uh, chaz.co.uk. And our phone number, which uh, we got a great group of individuals who, who are more than happy to help help on the phone. Our phone number is 0208 038 8514. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us today. It's been great catching up with you. Absolute pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much. Now back to the news and there was a big story that came out just last week and it was all to do with the new building safety bill. The health and safety executive has welcomed the publication of the government's draft building safety bill which aims to create the biggest change in building safety for a generation. The publication of this draft bill happened on the 20th of July and it follows the announcement made by the housing secretary which is Robert Jenrick in January that the HSC would create a new building safety regulator which is the BSR with the aim of implementing reforms that go further and faster to improving building safety than ever before following the Grenfell tragedy. The BSR will oversee the new, more stringent building safety regime for higher risk buildings, which prioritises blocks of flats of more than 18 metres high or more than six storeys tall in England. It will also have a broader oversight role in the safety and performance of buildings and in promoting the improvements in the competence and organisational capability of all those working in the built environment. The Health and Safety Executive will also lead the government's Joint Regulators Group, which will provide coordinated leadership to local authority and fire and rescue regulators during the transition to the new regulatory regime. It will support the development of close working arrangements between the BSI and local regulators, while continuing to work with the early adopters of the trial of the new safety approaches. The JRG will be chaired by Peter Baker, who's the Director of Building Safety and Construction Division of the HSC. And Mr Baker said, the BSR will create a new era for building safety 
we're working with wider government, local regulators, industry and residents. We want to ensure that a tragedy like Grenfell Tower never happens again. Through appropriate use of its enforcement powers under the new regulatory framework, the BSR will ensure that building safety risks are being properly managed and controlled throughout the life cycle of a building. It will also hold those with legal duties to account for significant failures. In my role as chair, the JRG and I will work together with members to ensure that the proposals are both robust and practical. Well, some of you will listen to the Fire Safety Matters podcast, which is our sister publication, our sister podcast. And if you haven't, I'd urge you to check it out. It's available on YouTube like this is or iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. Just type in Fire Safety Matters podcast or go to the website fsmatters.com. But we talked about this with Brian Sims, who's the editor of Fire Safety Matters. There's a lot going on over in the fire safety side of legislation. You know, conservative governments in the past have been accused of wanting to let industry self-regulate, not putting more red tape in place. Well, I don't think you can accuse this government of that because right now they're currently bringing in the new fire safety bill, which will make implementation changes to the existing legislation. The main legislation there is the fire safety order, for those of you that don't know. So add that into the building safety bill, which we're talking about here. Two massive, massive changes. OK, it's not surprising, is it, that massive changes had to happen in the wake of the Grenfell Tower tragedy. And anyone that's worked in the fire sector has said for a long time that there was a good chance of a major tragedy like that occurring. And, and I would say, unfortunately, often it takes a major tragedy before governments will act. Well, they are acting now and we're not in a position to be able to cast blame and neither do I want to do that. That is what the Grenfell Inquiry is currently looking into and the results of that will be published later in the year. But this has come on the back of Dame Judith Hackett doing her independent report for the government and Dame Judith was obviously chair of the HSC for a number of years and it's interesting on the back of her recommendation to set up you know, this, this side of things, more stringent building safety regime, the HSC is now going to be involved in that. And as we said, they will be creating the new building safety regulator. As we discussed many times, and everybody knows it, the HSC being the main regulator for health and safety across the UK, you know, the, the enforcer, so to speak, they are the prosecutor, that it's interesting they're becoming the regulator. It does make sense to me. Building safety is a critical part of health and safety. And it's not just on the form of residential premises, but commercial premises too. It's been a long time since there's been any changes to approve document B. 40 years since there's been a major change to building safety regulation. And, you know, the fire safety order came out in 2005. And as I said, that's now being looking to be amended through the fire safety bill. So I think this is positive. I think, you know, my dealings with the HSC, you know, that they are great to deal with. They are the obvious logical choice for regulator for this. And... I don't see how we can see it as a downside. Prioritising the safety of buildings and ultimately the life safety of people that occupy them has to be top of the agenda in the wake of a tragedy like Grenfell. So we'll keep an eye on this. It's only at its first reading stage. Somebody asked me earlier today, how long do I think it's going to be until this bill comes into place? Gosh, how long is a piece of string with, uh, <laughs> with, with Parliament? But I would say this feels like It'll be coming into play next year. Uh, I'd be surprised if it came into play earlier than that. And there has been plenty of feedback and continued feedback still requested on this by government. So this is this is big news. No, no, I, I could have led with this news this week, but I felt that we should uh, talk about, you know, some of the fatality statistics again, because that followed on from our previous podcast. But yeah, this, this, this is big news. And I, I would urge you all to... Keep following us on the Health and Safety Matters website. Now, I talked about fire safety through this, and I talked about Fire Safety Matters, our sister publication that we, that we print. But there's some news coming out of that that I do want to share with you. So Fire Safety Matters magazine has partnered with the Fire Industry Association, which is the biggest trade association for fire safety in the UK. And we've signed a multi-year strategic partnership with them, which I'm very, very proud of which is going to see us launching an annual UK fire safety guide, which will be published next year. It'll have everything in it. It's an annual printed magazine that will also be sent out digitally that will cover all aspects of fire safety. It'll cover trends, 
best practice, case studies, legislative changes, and what a time to do it when you think that next year we'll see a new fire safety bill in place. And as I've just said, a new building safety bill, it will be the go-to guide with market research, statistics, everything that you need from legislative updates will be in there. And it'll be completely free for you to all receive. And it'll offer CPD. No other magazine in the sector could do that. If you read Fire Safety Matters magazine, you can claim CPD now. If you listen to the FSM podcast or the webinars, you can get CPD now. So please do so. Please do go to fsmatters.com. But also we announced that we are also going to be launching a new Fire and Security Awards. Entries will open in May next year. And that will celebrate the great and the good for all the work that you guys do in the fire and security sectors of keeping premises safe and people safe. You'll know that we already have the Health and Safety Awards, which is the Safe and Health Excellence Awards. And the new date for the awards due for that is actually the um, 24th of November. And we hope that you'll join us on the 24th of November at the NEC in Birmingham at the Vox. But yeah, I felt and the FIA felt that we should really be bringing fire and security separate from that. And we're really excited that we're going to be doing a joint awards do with them. So keep your eyes peeled. If, if you work in those sectors, please do enter that. And we'll be opening up the entries of the Safety and Health Excellence Awards again in October this year. And, and they're a fabulous way of getting recognition for teams, individuals, products, businesses, so you're very proud of that announcement. And I've also mentioned that we'll be launching a careers hub there. And we'll be doing the same for health and safety, actually. We're going to be launching a new part of the Health and Safety Matters website, which will have all the latest training courses, career advice, CPD, and a big jobs board as well. It'll be a one-stop shop for advancing your career, whether that's through professional development, training, or looking for a new role. So that's coming in the next few weeks. So keep an eye out for that. So I just wanted to share that with you because we're trying to do as much as we can to, to give back to you guys for the way you're engaging with our content and to be able to get CPD and that career development is the feedback I've had from you that you want us to focus on. So that FIA agreement is a big one for us and a big one for you and we hope you'll take advantage of it. Keep your eyes peeled on that on fsmatters.com. Now speaking of career development and getting out and about, in a previous life, I was part of the health and safety event and the fire safety event before I bought this business, the publisher's HSM. And Health and Safety Matters is the official publication of the health and safety event. And the news came out just a couple of weeks ago that that event has now moved to April due to COVID-19. And it will take place on the 27th to the 29th of April, still at the NEC in Birmingham. Still co-located with the fire safety event, the security event and the facilities event, but also now co-located with the emergency services show and main tech. Now, we're delighted that the health and safety event is the sponsor of this podcast. And I sat down with uh, my old friend, David Bishop, who's the event manager for the health and safety event to catch up with what's been a quite testing time for him and his business and to give you guys an insight on why you should attend the health and safety event in April next year. Here's what Dave had to say. <music> Morning, Dave. How are you? I'm well, Mark. You? Yeah, good. Long time no see. It's been a while since we worked together. Good no, it's back seeing on. everybody through. Everybody, I see everybody through Zoom now, so um, it's uh, everybody shrunk and looking really fit and healthy. That's the only compliment you've ever given me, Dave. I'll take that. So let's talk about why I brought, brought you on. You have, as a company, 19 Group, which obviously you're the event director for the health and safety event. Events in general have had it very tough for coronavirus. It's tough for everybody. We can't take away the personal aspect of the personal charity side. But as a business, live events have only just been given the green light to run and you've had to move your dates twice. Can you tell us now when the health and safety event's going to run? Yes, we're absolutely delighted that we can clap, confirm that the show will take place at the NEC on the 27th to 29th of April. As I'm sure you can imagine, it's been um, quite traumatic. It's been very stressful Look, trying to deal with things that sometimes we haven't had answers for. On the whole, I'm very impressed with the exhibitors that we have got good relationships with, have been very supportive. There's been a lot of empathy. I think the, the fact that we... We all as businesses are in this together 
to a certain degree anyway, has helped in terms of unifying people and getting them to realise and understand that this is a crisis that's been caused by something completely out of our control. And how we how we deal with it now is, um, and how we get back to coping with the risk of COVID and viruses like this, we're just going to have to get used to um, looking after them and handling and um, managing our own individual risks as well as our company risks. But as I said, we're, we're, we're back on the traditional deadline of April 27th to 29th. It's a three-day event. When we postponed the original show from April 2020 to September, we were restricted in terms of tenancy because it was so last minute. So we had to reduce it to two days. And so I'm delighted that we're back to the traditional three-day event. And it, all, it, it, it helps people, gives people a bit more time to get there. It gives us more time to present all the wonderful content we've got that you're you're involved with and curating that and it just gives us a bit more flexibility to to do the things we want to do because the event is so diverse in terms of what we offer you know we could we could have a five-day event and still not have enough it still, still could put more content on and you know one of the things we've been doing over the last three three or four months I've, I've, i have to say i've lost track of time now every day seems the same and um it's a bit like groundhog day every morning but uh We've been doing a lot of things behind the scenes and it's, it's been good in some ways to shine a mirror at our business and reflect on what, what's good about it, what, what's, what needs improving and what we can do to develop and enhance the offering we've got. So we've been doing a lot of things in the digital realm um, to help customers who have been um, uh, severely handicapped by the fact that they haven't been able to go out and get new business. And there's been a real success. One of those is like what we call the Connect Plus offering, which is putting together visitors and exhibitors exhibitors who would have met at the show. And this just came about by the fact that we know that when visitors register for the event, the days of just walking around collecting stuff is long gone. People haven't got time for all that. So they do come for specific reasons, whether it to be attend one of the some of the seminar sessions that are free of charge or to go and source new suppliers, catch up with what's new, see what's innovative out there, and chat to suppliers who can perhaps um, offer advice about um, challenges they have. And this is, we've basically been working, putting these two things together, with irrespective of the show. So it's been really good, and we've had some really good success on it. So as I said, it's great that we're back. Well, hope to be back in April 27th to 29th. We've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of protocols we need to sort of get sorted out. But uh, hopefully by then people will know and understand more, much more and be more uh, prepared for how, how an event will, how an event will run by then. Um, running in September was always going to be a challenge. And uh, obviously with the government announcing it from October, it wouldn't have happened anyway. You've been in the sector a long time you've you've been for nearly 25 26 years in terms of the health and safety sector anyway that's a polite way of me reminding you about your age of course my friend um yeah, thanks, for, thanks for reminding me but what what's interesting here is you know when you came to help move that show to the next over the health and safety event you and i have spent a lot of time working together in terms of trying to really get an identity of why people should come to that show because getting people out of the office, especially in the coronavirus even now, is always going to become more challenging. So they have to have a real reason to go. So for those that are listening that haven't been to the health and safety event, and I'm sure will be keen to get out of their offices by April and join, why should they come to the health and safety event next April? I, I always think there's, there's a multifaceted reasons for coming to an event. There's the traditional, yes, you can network, meet peers. But let's be honest, if you're under pressure from time you need to put some real meat on the solution to actually saying i'm going to be out of the office and i'm going to be at this event and most of most of that will be down to a combination of the two things it's content in terms of what they can learn what they can improve their own personal career what they can take back to the office in terms of improving the environment they're looking after and the second thing is also about their network of suppliers and uh, and and, the, and the, the products and solutions and services they need to enhance their business, and putting those two together and having that offering is 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 the key attribute I think. And when we just before the show, six weeks before we cancelled, I looked at the 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 range of exhibitors we had. Um, the range of content we were providing, and it was first class. And you know, 
to, to be able to put all this on and not be able to then deliver it is it, it, it was so frustrating it felt like a we'd had this perfect bubble and it was burst and um so we will be doing this again there's a, a wealth of wealth of things that people could i can't i can't understand how anybody would go to that show and not find something that was of benefit from the you know the fantastic global brands we've got exhibiting there right the way through to the the, the especially thought out levels of content that we put on in the variety of theatres which are often themed and you know that we you know you, mark you were very instrumental in helping us bring in the the knowledge exchange which is a development from something we've done before where it's panel based and we try and make it things more interactive so actual visitors to the event have some have a chance to actually ask a bespoke question about how they think things could help how get advice from really well 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 educated people about how it could help their environment and their their place of work so it's a combination of lots of things like that and um and of course it's just great to to, to see how great our industry is and it's a celebration as well for the fact that the health and safety industry it from the in the uk is leading the forefront of everything around globally a lot of people commented on this in the past when i've been abroad it's very well regarded and a lot of people show what we do in the uk as the shining light for what they try and do and what will they replicate in other countries yeah, hundred percent. And obviously, HSM does put on the content for the Knowledge Exchange, and we will come back to people over the coming months of what contents are there in April. We're excited about it. We had a number of key speakers on. Yeah, equally gutted as you that we couldn't get that content on, but we will in April. And and the great thing about that particular theatre, apart from it being CPD accredited, is the agenda set by you. We set the topic. We get the experts. There is no script. There is no PowerPoint presentation. It's, you know, the listeners now, their chance to get in and ask experts exactly whatever they want, whether it's a legal expert or it's a worker height expert. Just quickly, I just reiterate what you said there, because the thing I like about is I think people sometimes when they're in different environments, we're all different. Some people are more confident and will speak out and some people don't. And I think that's what's great about that theatre is that people can listen and think, oh, actually, that question suits suits what I'm doing. And then they can find out a bit more and get more confident about asking different things and sharing expertise, sharing case, case studies, things like that, I think are really beneficial because it just shows that you're not, as a health and safety professional, isolated with unique, yet obviously everybody's got different challenges and nuances about their businesses but there are other companies and there are other people who've been through a similar challenge and it's great to be able to share that and then develop develop that and take it back home with and take it back to the workplace with confidence so moving on to as you were saying the leading brands i mean there's more leading brands in there than ever before just very very quickly could you give us an example of some of the brands uh, that are involved now you've got new premier partners there which are the biggest brands at the show just give us a taste of who we all could see on site well, yeah, and one of the, the key things we've been working with is our relationship with the British Safety Industry Federation, who are at the, have been at the forefront of um, advice and working behind the scenes in terms of the, the three letters that everybody knows now, PPE, which if you ask, I think, a multitude of people outside the health and safety industry six months ago, they would never have known what they were. So, um, and, and that's great. And I think that they're there for a fact is that that's an opportunity for us as an industry to kick on from this and try and push health and safety further up the agenda. Lots of people think it's important, but I think this is a great way, of, whilst it's in the public realm, when we've seen the effects of COVID and the pandemic on, on people, well, now actually, this could benefit the health and safety industry and make sure that people and lives are really important and people going to work in a in a in a risky environment actually deserve to come home and and they need the right equipment they need they need it to be fit for purpose and they know that uh, buying it from members of the british safety industry federation is, is is the correct way to go you know that's what's driven this remit for us to get the right type of caliber of companies there so you know we've got really well known global brands like uvex and we've got you know companies like delta plus we've got moldex um mcr uh, uh Bolle. there's a there's a Univet, who are you know another eyewear company. There's a there's a multitude of companies that have got really good, well established expertise 
within their and they're driving products forward and they're innovating all the time you know we've got some great support from british suppliers like b swift as well who have been very 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 active and helpful and pushing pushing the british uh, pushing the british agenda very strongly and you know i'm del- I'm, I'm so happy that we've we've got these relationships and the the idea is that we make sure that when people come to our event they know that if they talk to what talk to some of our exhibitors those exhibitors have got a certain level of standard of customer service they their products they supply meet CE markings they've got the right credentials for you to buy with confidence so dave you know just in, just in closing obviously i'm very familiar and for those that aren't you know the health and safety event when it runs in april next year the 27th or 29th it'll be collocated with as always the fire safety event the security event and the facilities event obviously new this year to be collocated with it is the emergency services show and main tech uh, back in the day main tech was collocated with it. it's good to see main tech back collocated with it but for those that have heard what you said today about content the leading brands and why it's more than just a chance to meet meet your peers how can they find out more information about the event where, where can they go to register for free to it because it's one ticket that gets you access to all of those um shows, six yeah. events and what's the what's and the i have way? to say i'm Having been a visitor to the emergency services show for years and years, uh, when it was originally at Stonely and been at the NEC for the for the near few recently, I think there's a real synergy for, for between health and safety in that event because it, it looks after all the emergency services and the procurement chain for all the blue light so industry. So there's lots of synergies, lots of companies that number of companies that exhibit there exhibit health and safety and and vice versa. So there's there's some really good synergy there. So that's quite exciting, and we'll see how that plays out. But the best way to to get a ticket, go to healthandsafetyevent.com. All the details are there. The website's updated. You can register for free, and then that will open. Once we've got your details, we'll be constantly keeping in contact with um, you as a visitor to updating you with all the things that are going on and the, the speaker sessions and things like that. So. Um, yeah, healthandsafetyevent.com is where I suggest people to go to. Well, we're grateful for you to continue sponsoring this podcast. You know, we're delighted to be the official publication of the Health and Safety event. Health and Safety Matters is the official publication of the Health and Safety event. And, you know, I, I always used to work on the show. You know, I believe in the show. I think I may have had a small arm in getting Dave to come in to be a part of the show. And it's really going places. And, you know, we're, I can't stress enough just how much that event has moved forwards it really offers a unique feel from the co-location the emergency services side definitely adds something different now and the maintenance side through main tech but if you want career development and and best practice being shared or you want to go and see leading brands across a wide spectrum as a health and safety practitioner this is definitely the place for you to go and i say that impartially with no iron in that fire i don't work for that organization anymore but i am proud of our affiliation with it so dave thank you for joining us today and can't wait to see you in april my friend thank you mark um and stay safe that's all we've got time for this episode of the health and safety matters podcast you can see this podcast every fortnight on a monday please do share it with your industry colleagues and your friends please do give us a positive review whether you do that through itunes youtube spotify google play in the meantime you can get all the latest health and safety news via our website which is hsmsearch.com and you can go there to also sign up to our twice a week e-newsletter or to subscribe to receive HSM Magazine six times a year. If you want to get any questions asked on this podcast, please use the hashtag HSM Podcast. Thanks for joining us today, and I'll see you next time. (music) 